I think most people wonder what we felt when we were there to examine the shroud. And uh, under the circumstances, because we were there to do science, we had to suspend some of our, more of our personal feelings and sort of set them aside because we had a very ambitious se series of tasks to perform in a very short period of time. I don't think it was lost on anyone that we were doing something of historic nature. Once our evidence was collected and our data reduced and our papers published, um, I eventually came to a point, and it took many years, but I eventually came to a point where I had to apply uh, what Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said out of the lips of Sherlock Holmes, that if you eliminate all the possibilities, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, is most likely the truth. And without a doubt, I was absolutely forced into accepting, because there was no other possible explanation, this has to be what it appears to be. People often ask me, does this prove the resurrection? Or is this evidence of the resurrection? Now, that's a real problem for somebody from the scientific background, because resurrection isn't something we can go into a laboratory and test. We can't go into a lab and decide, uh, resurrect people to see what kind of images we can make. So resurrection becomes more a test of faith than science. But I always point out the shroud did not come with a book of instructions. So the answer to faith isn't going to be on that piece of cloth, but more likely in the eyes and the hearts of those who look upon it. On this Good Friday, a new book claims the Shroud of Turin is no forgery. Forgery, rather. The Shroud is a cloth that, according to tradition, was used to wrap the body of Jesus after his crucifixion. 25 years ago, the British Museum tested the Shroud and decided it was made more than a thousand years after Jesus died. Now scientists have done infrared tests on the piece of cloth. They say it's up to 2,300 years old, so it could be the real thing. The Shroud of Turin will be shown on Vatican TV tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will see the legendary Shroud of Turin for the first time in 30 years, amid reports of new and mysterious evidence about the sacred relic. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. For the first time in 40 years, new images of the Shroud of Turin will be broadcast on television. The event marked by an introduction by Pope Francis himself. Believers are convinced the Shroud covered Jesus' crucified body. The fabric is covered in bloodstains, dirt and watermarks, but its most often debated attribute, this, the outline of a face. 1988 research seen here in this documentary used carbon dating to determine the cloth was from medieval times and the whole thing was a hoax. But a new book by an Italian professor argues those tasks were performed on fibers used to repair the shroud in the Middle Ages, that the cloth itself is from Jesus' time. When you consider that, that there are no substances on the cloth that were conceivably used by an artist, and the fact that the blood on the cloth is human blood, it would suggest that the cloth is probably authentic. But how did that image get there? One theory, ammonia vapor released by a body mixed with a linen. No confirmed relics exist of Jesus' life, but historians agree that he lived. In about 93 AD, the Roman historian Josephus wrote about a man named Jesus, describing a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. Other Roman authors wrote of his baptism by John the Baptist, his crucifixion by the Roman emperor Pontius Pilate. Photo document where the grayscale is inverted so that the photo negative is the positive image. Secondly, the shroud contains three-dimensional information. And so we were able to reproduce a statue of this man, the cadaver as it laid in the tomb, based on information in a two-dimensional cloth. That is unlike any other document in the history of the world. There is no paint anywhere on the shroud. We were looking for that. In 1978, an elite team of scientists came to Italy to study the shroud to answer just this question. What formed the image on the shroud? They found out that there is no paint, no pigment, inorganic or no organic, no varnish, no dye, and get this, no directionality, no brush strokes whatsoever. Whatever this is, 
This is not human artwork. Perfect time to talk a little about the Shroud of Turin. Are you convinced that that's authentic? I, I'm fairly convinced. I would say okay. mid to low probability. I just told somebody over lunch today that I would put probability for the Shroud at 60 to 80, 85%, depending on what kind of mood I'm in. Okay. And I'm just saying that to accept the fact that we all have interpretations of data. So a brief overview of what the Shroud is and... It's a, a linen cloth, three to one weave, a, a little over 14 feet long, a little over three feet wide. And it buries a body. If the body's inside, like a say a, a pen right here, the cloth is a 14 foot cloth that wraps around the head and it loops because it's not exactly on the top of the head. So it loop, loops a little bit and, it, and the open ends are at the feet. But the most interesting thing about the shroud is there's real blood on it. There's a body image. There are hundreds of burial garments in existence. None have body images like this. There's a body image on it. And according to a recent uh, scientific, uh, let's say, conference in Washington, state of Washington, um, every scientist, over a dozen, who responded to the comment of what is the image on the shroud made of, they all, I understand, all came to the conclusion that the image on the shroud is because of radiation from the dead crucified body underneath. So the man is crucified, has virtually all the marks associated with death by, death by crucifixion of Jesus in the New Testament. But there's a cloth with an image on it, and the radiation appears to have come out from the body onto the cloth and it only affected the surface fibers. Virtually nothing we know only affects surface. Like if you, like you couldn't have burned the image in there. Well, picture, picture a thread having 200 fibrils. That's how small the fibrils are in a single thread. The image area is like on one or two fibrils deep on top of a thread. So whatever made the mark is very, very shallow. So it's not paint, dye, powder, foreign substance on the shroud. There's no because foreign like powder, I guess, would have gone deeper into the... Even powder would, but there's no substance that you can put on. Let's put it this way. You can't fake the shroud today. A guy said to me... Even yeah, today with all of our technology. That's right. A, a fellow said to me, just talking to him just the other day, he's, a, he's a, uh, a PhD physicist who deals with uh, dating. And he said, he said, and don't give me the argument. He's a Christian, but he said, don't give me the argument that we can't explain the shroud because that's just nothing. There's a lot of things we can't explain. So we can't explain the pyramids. And I said, yeah, but there's a little bit of a difference here. You can make a pyramid today. <laughs> you cannot make the Shroud of Turin. What does the Shroud of Turin, what does the cloth look like up close? You know, one of the, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, what does it look like when you're up there and close to it? And I'll tell you something, <laughs> you know, my first impressions was, this is in way too good a condition to be this old. That was my first impression. And people, skeptics particularly, have said, well, there you go. There's proof that it's not that old. And then I thought about it and I realized, why don't we have this mentioned in the Gospels except maybe in one or two places, but not with an image on it or anything else? Well, you've got to remember, first of all, this had blood on it. Jewish law forbids that leaving the grave or even touching it. Okay, now imagine now if it's not only got blood but an image as well. You couldn't say that. You couldn't step out and say, look, because there were iconoclasts that would want to destroy it. Not only that, you'd be punished for taking this cloth that's supposed to be in a grave and handling it and, and taking it out of the tomb and with an image on it. So they had to keep it a secret. I mean, they might have been the next one on the cross if they came running out of the tomb going, look what we found. <laughs> I don't think that was going to happen. And one man said to me, Mr. Schwartz, does this image violate the second commandment? So now I'm standing there, and I'm, second, second commandment, second. So I thought about it for a moment and I said, well, sir, I said, our team did the most in-depth scientific study and we were able to determine that it's neither a painting nor a photograph nor applied by the hand of a man. So to answer your question, if it's none of those things, okay, and it wasn't applied 
by the hand of a man, then it was a naturally occurring or supernaturally occurring image. Perhaps God did it. I said, so in, the, in that case, since it wasn't done by the hand of a man, then God did the image and it consequently could not violate any of his commandments. Could <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, oh, well, that's a brilliant answer. And then his friend speaks up and says, do you know who this man is? And I said, have no idea. This is the Anglican Archbishop of Wellington, New Zealand. So now I'm embarrassed. Here I am, a Jew lecturing an archbishop on theology. <laughs> and I start to apologize. He goes, no, no, I'm writing it down. He says, that's a brilliant answer. We, we'd been talking about where the wound in the hands is. And unlike all the art that has been done, you can see here that the exit wound is actually here at the back of the wrist. The Romans would start by driving the nail here in the thinner furrow between these two uh, kind of fleshy parts of your palm. So it's still in the palm, but it's further up in the palm, and they usually came in at an angle, making it harder to tear it out. And the exit wound would be about right here, and if you look right here, that's where we have the exit wound on the shroud. So, uh, and of course you can see these are the original patches, very distinctly noticeable as patches, and not as, uh, you know, sewn in to be invisible, but to be very visible. And where are the L-shaped? The L-shaped burn holes, let's see if we can find, on this half of the shroud are the smaller ones, and there's one, and there's the other. This is the fourth level, and this is the third level. If you were to look at the dorsal view, you would see them more distinctly, and I can show that to you on that uh, replica over there, and you can the see. Scourging marks are just... The, and, and you'll notice scourge marks on his chest, yeah. on his arms, on his legs, not just the back, but if you're whipping somebody and they come around, yeah, they come around and hit you in the front, too. So uh, you have all these these things that, you know, there's no way some medieval artist could have even thought of these things, let alone create an image without painter or right. photographic emulsion. We're here with Dame Isabel Pixek in her amazing studio, which is, it, it has a sense of reverence to it that is overwhelming when uh, both Richard and I walked in. Just, it's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. Why do you think the Shroud of Turin is not a painting? It is, uh, it cannot even be denied. The Shroud cannot be a painting because it breaks almost every rule of nature. And when natural law is broken, that's it. And le hmm. let me tell you why. Everybody, every layman thinks that a painting is paint particles on some surface. No. It is paint particles tied together by some kind of liquid, and that goes on the, on the surface. And as long as that liquid is completely continuous, you see a continuous image, and that is a painting. The minute the, the liquid is uh, hurt, missing, parts of it missing, or entirely miss missing, it cannot be a painting it is because it is against natural law. Hmm. So as long as we, you see a continuous image, you have to have an absolutely intact, continuous paint film. And that's, that's the, the very important thing, the, the liquids which carry a painting. The shroud has an absolutely continuous image. There is no interruption, and there is not one bit of liquid <laughs> tying material on it. This is a nonsense. This, nobody can paint like that. Such a painting does not exist. It cannot exist. What got you interested in the shroud? How did you, I mean, I'm looking around the studio and I would call this sacred art for lack of a it's better. It's sacred art. It's yes. sacred art. And it's like I said earlier, there's a, when you walk in the door, you just feel um, a I don't know where they use the word supernatural peace, but you feel a supernatural peace when you walk into what I would call a modern day sanctuary. 
Mm -hmm. um, it is a, in essence, a church, a place of assembly. There is a, a sacredness here. What got you involved in the shroud? When did you first view it, and, and what piqued your interest? Well, believe it or not, at the age of two, I already was doing drawings. At the age of 11, I won national first prize with my painting. At the age of 14, I painted in the Vatican. So it, it, my career came so early, and I would say that from the age of six or so, I really almost was drawn to this rod. Mm -hmm. I really felt that this is extremely important, not only from the religious point of view, but from the scientific point of view, because some new kind of science opens through this rod. Uh, one of the most noted skeptics, I won't mention his name, but people will know who I'm talking about, uh, once told me that, oh, you know, um, th all that work of the stirrup team is the rantings of believers. It's very simple, if you don't understand the science, that past a certain point, somebody throwing the science at you, you stop and you, you're not qualified to challenge the science, so you attack the scientist. And that's this particular skeptic's normal technique. And he always then throws the religious card out. But he can't do that with me because I'm Jewish. Okay, if I have an instrument, say a spectrophotometer, I'm taking a reading off of a piece of cloth. When I push the button to take that reading on the instrument, do you think that instrument cares whether I'm a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim? Or a heathen, it doesn't care. The data is the data. So if you don't like what Stirp's conclusions were, go to the peer-reviewed science, study the data, come, come up with your own conclusions, but it's there. And well, nobody else has done that but us. The sedarium of Oviedo was a cloth that has blood on it that has preserved in Oviedo, Spain from the seventh century. When overlaid with the shroud, apparently we see that there are points of congruency. Well, the, the sedarium is, uh, it not only has blood, but has other fluid stains, uh, probably from the nose and mouth of the victim that the cloth wrapped. There's little doubt that it was a face cloth, the kind of cloth that would have been wrapped around the face of the man of the shroud, assuming that it was him. Um, and to this day, our custom is pretty much everywhere in the world, if somebody dies, say uh, an accident victim, the first thing you do is cover the face. So the same thing would have been true uh, even in the first century, that the, out of respect for the dead, you cover the face. The interesting thing about the, sh about the sudarium is it, it does have provenance back to about seventh century. It also has these blood and fluid stains that when compared to some of the blood stains, particularly those of the back of the head on the shroud, there does seem to be a very kind of congruency that does exist. I don't know about the number of points and I don't know that using a technique usually applied to fingerprints is appropriate for image analysis. You mentioned on my radio show that a million pound donation was given. Uh, tell us about that. I guess the real irony of the whole carbon dating business, since we're talking about it, is the fact that uh, after the three laboratories ultimately did their testing, published their results in uh, uh, Nature, a radiocarbon article, um, Oxford Laboratory received a one million pound, British pound sterling, anonymous contribution for debunking the shroud. Uh, interestingly enough, Dr. Tite, who was from the British Museum, left the British Museum, came to Oxford, and some of that money built him a nice lab at Oxford. And, and look, you know, if, that's, if the order of events is as I've stated them, and that happened after the fact, then okay, well, so be it. But when did these three labs find out that this contribution was coming? Did they have any foreknowledge or forewarning that this was the case, or was it a big surprise to them that came two months after the dating was released? Now, of course, if, if they didn't know about it, no harm, no foul. But if they knew about it, if they knew this contribution was gonna come, depending on what they found about the shroud, had to be for debunking the shroud, then, I question the entire process. Everybody looks at the two images like this, for instance. Two separate images which have nothing to do with each other, it seems like. Hmm. And nobody thinks of it that they were on both sides of the shroud and they were wrapped around a figure. 
So we, they were not flat, they were wrapped around. So what does that mean? You look at it, why is it so separate? Why one would not influence the other? The other, right. And then you realize suddenly, heaven's sakes, we never noticed it, that there is a, a horizontal um, object, which we never noticed before, going through, which slices the shroud, the shroud body into two halves. One has nothing to do with the other. What, what is the, the single phenomenon which can cause that? We, we are dealing with two event horizons. Hmm. And we are already a little bit familiar with event horizons, only they are a little bit different than the Schrodt's event horizon. The event horizon is an object which when you approach, it cuts space-time into two halves. One you can know up to a point which you are approaching from your side. But there will be a point when you cannot know anything anymore what is behind it. The last photon would hit it, the last time quanta will hit it. And after that, nothing. For all practical purposes, time and space have stopped. Is that correct? We are very close to it. And I will explain that. Okay. The, this thing is... So the body, the body laid, laid like this in the tomb. Yes. Just like we see it on the shroud. Yes, yes. But suddenly, at the event, it began to levitate. Yes, the, the gravity was defeated the second law. Then time and space stops. And, and there is a total, for the first time in the history of the universe, there is a total time collapse. And even nature, the, the scriptures kind of hint at it that strange things were happening. That was the moment when time stopped. When, when time stops, the very last information it had, it would project on, on the event horizon on both sides. And when finally we have no event horizon, it releases its secret that there was a, a Big Bang type singularity. There is a explosion which cannot be described. Hmm. The universe would have stopped existing if somehow it would not have been cut to a very, very minimal time. And that's why we see on the shroud an unknown thing which looks like burn, but it's, but it's not. not. In 2002, a clandestine, is the only word I can use, Restoration was done without consulting any scientists, just a small group in Turin took it upon themselves, although I must admit they got Pope John Paul II's permission, but I'm not too sure that by then John Paul knew what he was signing or even, or even if he signed it or perhaps the Secretary of State might have signed it. So it was done ostensibly with his permission and they removed all the patches and they removed the backing cloth and they scraped all the burned stuff away and they vacuumed it and they use steam in areas to get some of the creases out. And it's now seven centimeters longer. And they virtually eliminated the possibility for a lot of science. I had never heard of the shop before 1997. And I was flipping channels and saw the face on the TV. And um, there was something very unknowing that I had, that that was really Jesus' face. This vision inspired Benford and her husband to find proof that the carbon dating results were wrong. But they thought they'd found a vital clue, which proved the carbon dating was flawed. Look here. Nowhere else is there this definitive, intentional, dark green. 
while checking images taken in 1978, Benford noticed something strange about the piece of shroud chosen for the carbon dating samples. The herringbone pattern that is so consistent elsewhere in the cloth looked misaligned. Our theory is that there is a mixture of 16th century cloth and 1st century cloth and the data that we're finding on the cloth matches that theory. Benford and Marino believe that the carbon date was wrong because the section chosen for the samples was contaminated with later material. They believe the original linen was repaired with completely different cotton thread in the 16th century. The repair was then expertly dyed so that it would be invisible to the naked eye. When you do this type of wee weaving, um, you're not just stitching two pieces of material together. And that would give you all of one and all of the other. It's more like this. The ends are unraveled in the main cloth. The ends are unraveled in the patch. They are spliced together and the threads are connected and interwoven so you see literally an interweaving such that you have old and new on both sides of the equation. Well, I'm skeptical when I'm listening to this but they had taken photographs that were available of the samples taken for the carbon data and they had submitted these to several textile experts who didn't know they were looking at a photograph from the shroud and each of these textile experts independent of each other said you know this looks rewoven the samples taken for radiocarbon dating were cut from one corner of the shroud adjacent to a seam it was effectively an area that was damaged by someone cutting a piece out of it possibly to sell as relic so it needed to be repaired Benford and Marino argued that because the carbon dating sample contained material from both the 16th and 1st centuries, the result was in between the two. Searching for definitive proof, Benford took a closer look at the carbon dating results to see if there was anything odd about the data at the three different test centers. And hidden in the numbers, she found evidence that some parts of the test sample contained more 16th century cotton. If you look at their unpublished data now, Arizona had some of the oldest dates at 1238 and the youngest at 1430. And you think, were they really 200 years off in their lab? Well, perhaps it's because of material they took from their both of their different sides. Now, we don't know that for sure and they haven't confirmed that, but that's interesting. Oxford is the next oldest and they're the, the closest to, to this side with the most main first century material. Zurich is in the middle, and guess what? They have the middle mount, and they have the middle dates. In 2000, Benford and Marino published a paper claiming that medieval cotton was introduced into the damaged corner of the linen shroud. Their claims were immediately dismissed by the scientific community one scientist in particular was outraged. One of the things Ray had a problem with was the fact these weren't scientists, and he didn't take them very seriously. I think he glumped us in with the lunatic friend at that time, and probably for many times <laughs> beyond that. I had given up on the shroud, and this was about the same time that the lunatic fringe were coming up with an infinite number of ways the date could be wrong, and this was just the last straw. I got a call from Ray, and he goes, what the hell is this? <laughs> this is nonsense. I can prove these people wrong in five minutes. And I said, well, Ray, go for it. He was the gunfighter. He was one of those guys that if he didn't like what you were saying, he'd have pulled out his six-shooter and fired off six before he had a chance to take a breath. He was not very tolerant, especially of people doing bad science. Rogers was in a unique position to confirm if the linen shroud contained later cotton repairs. Ray had in his possession from 1978, the tape samples lifted from the surface of the shroud. But remember, those were not big fibers. Those were fibrils taken from the surface. He also had some samples that were taken from the shroud 
by Professor Reyes, who took samples in 1973 from a corner that was immediately adjacent to the area taken for carbon dating. But Ray Rogers was in a race against time. He was fighting a losing battle with cancer, and he knew his end was near. His old friend, Barry Schwartz, was determined that Rogers should have the chance to speak from beyond the grave. I am Ray Rogers, Raymond N. Rogers, and I've been working on the Shroud since 1977. He filmed a detailed interview with Rogers so that the dying scientist could put on the record exactly what he found. So I read their paper and I thought, I've got the samples that can shoot that full of holes. So I got out the Ross samples and I got out the, uh, the Shroud samples and I went to work again. A couple hours later, he calls me and he goes, boy, he says, I can't believe it. He says, they were right. There's cotton here. He says, there's no cotton in the rest of the shroud, but there's cotton interwoven here. They must be right. No one was more shocked than Rogers. His observations seemed to confirm Benford and Marino's theory. The original linen shroud contained additional cotton threads. To confirm this, he needed to examine the threads that were carbon dated. Until I could get a sample from the real radiocarbon cloth, a documented sample, you know, I couldn't prove anything. The carbon dating process destroyed the sample, but all the labs involved in the 1988 test kept parts of their sample in reserve. The authentic radiocarbon sample that I got, these segments of yarn were cut from the middle of the radiocarbon sample, so there was no question about them. And when I looked at these samples from the radiocarbon area, there's no problem at all finding cotton in them. Rogers was now convinced that Benford and Marino were right. And he found other evidence they had missed. He knew from his own tests in 1978 that the shroud was free of artificial dyes and pigments. And yet, when he looked at surviving threads from the carbon dating samples, that's exactly what he found. You've got photomicrographs that demonstrate this very clearly. The cotton fibers from the radiocarbon sample are fairly heavily coated with the gum dye mordant, and some of the linen fibers don't show any of that at all. They look just as slick as anything, and it didn't stick to them. He believed the dye was used to make the cotton repair invisible to the naked eye. If you happen to hit a place where a yarn segment from the original shroud was spliced into the new uh, reweave part, the splice, very definitely shows the new yarn that was being put in and dyed to match. The only thing in the shroud that was dyed or stained was this uh, radiocarbon area. So my hypothesis at the moment is that this was done on purpose to fool your eye. This was further evidence that the shroud was repaired with cotton in exactly the area where the carbon dating sample was taken. And when we went back and looked at the ultraviolet photographs, here is this area that's significantly darker. It doesn't fluoresce as much. And it's just this area that, uh, around the raw sample and where the radiocarbon sample was cut. And if they had looked at any of the photographs that we had and studied the information we had as of 1978, they would have known that that was the worst possible place they could have taken a sample. My conclusion is that that area was manipulated. It was done by somebody with great skill and different materials than were used to make the shroud. Here's the whole crux of it. Linen is very difficult to dye, and it ages as time goes on, so it's colored. So in order to match a reweaving with the original color, you have to use cotton, and you dye the cotton. 
in 2005, just five weeks before losing his battle with cancer, Rogers prepared to publish his last academic paper. He wasn't casting doubt on the science of carbon dating, but the selection of a contaminated sample from the damaged corner of the shroud. In his opinion, the carbon dating tests didn't reveal its true age. But one fateful decision was about to threaten Ray Rogers' last hope of carrying out a new carbon dating test. By 2005, the scientific mainstream thought they'd laid the mystery of the Turin Shroud to rest, dated between 1260 and 1390. But scientist Ray Rogers had found new evidence suggesting the carbon dating sample was contaminated. I'm coming to the conclusion that it has a very good chance of being the piece of cloth that was used to bury the historic Jesus. He writes a paper that's accepted for publication in Thermochemica Acta, January of 2005. And that paper is the only peer-reviewed science that challenges the carbon date with anything credible up until that point in time. Rogers knew that his findings needed to be tested with more sophisticated equipment. So he contacted a colleague who still worked at Los Alamos Laboratory, Bob Villarreal. It was a race uh, for him because he knew he was dying. He wanted to know, is this corner of the shroud of the same composition, whether it was flax or linen or cotton. If it was cotton, it's not the same as the main shroud cloth, which is linen. Rogers would never live to discover the answer. He lost his long battle with cancer on the 8th of March, 2005. He was 78 years old. After Ray's death, Bob Villarreal was determined to honor his promise. He passed the fibers to a specialist, and something remarkable happened. I received a call from him, and he said, the thread that I was going to analyze broke into two pieces. Is God going to be mad at me? <laughs> Just as Rogers suspected, the threads appeared to be two pieces of cotton and linen woven together. In 2008, the findings were announced to the world. They supported the theory that the carbon dating sample was poorly chosen. My closing thought is this. The shroud represents a, it, 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 it conforms with the gospel, past, present, and future. And millions of people say, why do I have to believe that Jesus rose again from the dead in some supernatural resurrection? Why can't I just believe that he was a good man who did good things? Mm -hmm. And I submit you can believe whatever you want, but if that's all you believe, it's not enough. Now, why do I say it's not enough? Because if, if, if Jesus is not risen, he's dead. And a dead Jesus could offer us nothing. Only a Jesus who has risen from the dead, who has defeated the power of death, only that Jesus has the right, the ability, and the authority to offer us anything beyond this life. That's point number one. Point number two, past, present, and future. I've already talked the present. In the present, we see on the cloth the price that was paid. That's the receipt. The receipt. So, but also speaks to a future event. And if, if, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, you know, you, you know, listen, I show you a mystery. Right. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there in a is. flash, just like that. There it is. And this is a future event. It hasn't happened yet, right. but I think this is yeah, a that, snapshot. That, that's a prototype. This yeah. is a picture. This prototype is a, of the rapture. This is a preview of coming attraction. <laughs> And, well, and well so that's what I think it means prophetically. 